بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله this is now our fourth lesson of the tafsir of سورة البقرة uh, in the previous lessons we looked at the introduction to the surah of سورة البقرة we spoke about the nature of the Qur'an and how it is a book of guidance for the muttaqin. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a number of descriptions about the muttaqin, how they believe in the unseen, establish the prayers, give the zakat, etc. And then we spent last week uh, in the last lesson essentially speaking about the qualities of those who disbelieve. In this lesson we will begin uh, by speaking about the characteristics of a third group of people, the munafiqeen, or the munafiqoon, the hypocrites. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we will see, spends a lot more time speaking about the hypocrites than he does speaking about the believers and the general disbelievers. So there are many lessons for us to learn in that. So for the disbelief, for the believers, Allah speaks... Uh, for three ayat, he mentions three ayat about the believers, two ayat about the disbelievers, and here we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention 13 verses. Okay, 13 verses about the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says now in verse 8, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And so from amongst mankind are those who say that we believe in Allah. آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ We believe in Allah and we believe in the last day. وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ But they in reality are not true believers. They in reality are not true believers. Now what is interesting to note firstly is that this category of believers we said is referring to the munafiqun, the hypocrites. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not explicitly said that these are the hypocrites. He didn't say that. Whereas when it came to discussing the believers and the disbelievers, he made that clear. This book is a guidance for who? The muttaqin. So now we know who we're talking about. When it came to the disbelievers... إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who disbelieve. So it's very clear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the, uh, the disbelievers. But in this ayah, if you listen very carefully about the munafiqun, there's no mention of nifaq. It says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ From amongst mankind are those who say, we believe in Allah on the last day, but they do not truly believe. There's no mention of nifaq. There's no mention of hypocrisy. How comes? Here, some of the scholars of tafsir, they said here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't made mention of the hypocrites or their nifaq explicitly because they are so uh, disgraceful in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that them as a category as a name, as a title, do not even deserve to be mentioned. Instead we say, وَمِنَ nas. You know, there are some people. There are some people who say we believe in Allah on the last day, but they are not truly believers. So you can see, even see by the, the choice of words, وَمِنَ nas from amongst mankind. There are some people who say we believe in Allah on the last day, but they are not truly believers. And so this is to show the, 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 their status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they are disgraced in the sight of Allah, these hypocrites. 
And as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place them in the lowest ranks of the hellfire. Dark al asfali min al nar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the munafiqun, the hypocrites, they will be placed in the lowest place in the hellfire because they are the worst of creation. The worst of creation. Now, You might think, okay, hypocrites. Allah has spoken about the believers, the, the disbelievers, the hypocrites. Now, which category do we belong to? Inshallah, we belong to the category of the muttaqeen, hopefully, inshallah, the believers. So you might think, these hypocrites, who are they? We see them maybe as an outside element, but in reality, there's something we should fear for our own selves. All of the companions used to fear nifaq for their own selves. They used to fear that they would fall into hypocrisy. There is a famous story of Hanzala, the Sahabi, who said, who went to Abu Bakr and he said, Nafaqa Hanzala, that Hanzala has turned into a hypocrite. And Abu Bakr, he said, why are you calling yourself a hypocrite? He goes, when I'm with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I am reminded of Allah and the Akhirah. But when I return home with my family, to my family, I forget Allah and the Akhirah. So I'm a hypocrite. And Abu Bakr said, subhanallah, if that's the case, I feel the same as well. So maybe I'm a hypocrite as well. So they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they explained of their situation, they explained the situation to him. And he said, no, you know, there is a time for this and a time for that. I mean, there's a time where your iman will be very high and there is a time where you will, you know, be off track slightly and maybe dunya will come, come to you and, and, and distract you. But there's a time for this and a time for that. Meaning don't assume that you have become a full hypocrite by that. Still though we find that the Sahaba used to fear nifaq for themselves. They used to fear nifaq for themselves. Umar ibn Khattab, one of the greatest companions, feared nifaq for himself. As when Hudayf ibn al-Yaman was uh, informed of who the hypocrites were, the Prophet ﷺ had special knowledge of the hypocrites because otherwise hypocrisy is, very, is something hard to tell. You know, if someone says to you, you're a believer, but inside they're not believers. How can you tell? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the strongest opinion, uh, taught the Prophet ﷺ names of a number of the hypocrites of Medina. Some of the companions were aware of them, of their names. And when Umar ibn Khattab heard that one of the companions was aware of, of the names, what did he do? He ran to him and he said, am I amongst them? Am I amongst them? And this is Umar ibn Khattab. Now we can look at this incident and think, wow, mashallah, you know, these companions were very pious and what have you. But then we look to ourselves and we think, maybe they were just being very cautious. Maybe they were just being very cautious and therefore in reality we have nothing to fear. But no, this, should really, this shouldn't be the case. You find most of the companions were wary and were cautious about uh, falling into the state of nifaq. Now, um, the Prophet ﷺ also used to fear for his ummah, uh, for this nifaq as well, hypocrisy. And he used to fear for the effects of hypocrites in the community as well. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna akhwafa ma akhafu ala ummati kulla Munafiqin Alim al Lisan. The thing I fear for my Ummah the most uh, is every Munafiq hypocrite who is Alim al Lisan, who is well spoken and is eloquent. Because Nifaq, as we will come to learn, has a detrimental effect on the community. And we will see that, inshallah, in due time. Now, what is nifaq? Let's speak about nifaq, hypocrisy in terms of its definition. How do we understand? What is the essence of uh, nifaq? And then we'll go back to the ayah. Nifaq literally means, we can say, as Ibn Kathir said, izhar uh, al wa israr al-sharr. It means to manifest good, but to hide evil. To manifest good and to hide evil. And essentially what it means is when a person's outward state 
is different to their inward state. When a person's outward state is different to their inward state. That is a hypocrisy. So when there is a complete contradiction and an opposite from the outward state and the inward state. And uh, we mentioned this, I think, in a previous lesson, that nifaq is related to the word nafaq. And nafaq in the Arabic language, even today, we use nafaq to refer to a tunnel. It has one uh, entry point and it has an exit point, And you go through the tunnel. This is because hypocrites, essentially, they leave, they enter the religion and they leave it at the same time. Meaning they haven't truly entered the religion. And there used to be a, a desert rat. Uh, called the uh, Yarbu'a in Arabic, in English the Jabawa. It's a desert rat. Um, it, it looks like a normal mouse, but it's got his hind legs are, are, are very long, and it has big ears. And this Jabawa, uh, Yarbu'a, uh, also known as Nafuqa, Nafuqa in old Arabic language it was known as Nafuqa. And you can see the resemblance with Nifaq, hypocrisy, and Nafuqa. Uh, this desert rat, what would it do? It would essentially it would dig a hole for its burrow. And usually burrows, they have one hole. Okay? They, they come in and out of. In and out of. Uh, this uh, desert uh, mouse, what it would do is it would create two holes. Two tunnels, essentially, le- leading to the burrow. So one to enter, and there was an emergency exit. An emergency, emergency exit. But you couldn't see the emergency exit from, from the outside because it would dig the tunnel all the way, almost until it reaches the surface. But then it will stop digging. So what would happen is that if it, for example, a snake came in into the burrow, uh, it can easily leave through the other exit and then it will tap its head on the remaining part of the, the tunnel and then the tunnel will collapse and then it will quickly leave. Or quickly leave. So it would leave without anyone noticing. It would escape without anyone realizing. And so hypocrisy is like that. You know, they enter into Islam, but then they leave without anyone truly noticing because you can't see it. You can't see it. So they openly profess Islam, but they leave Islam without even really entering it. And so that is what nifaq uh, linguistically uh, means. Um, now, there are two types of nifaq that the scholars, um, they spoke about. Uh, nifaq i'tiqadi and nifaq amali. There is the nifaq of i'tiqad, of belief, and nifaq, hypocrisy in terms of action. Now, hypocrisy of belief is the worst type of hypocrisy. This is when a person is technically really in the sight of Allah, a disbeliever, and he will be in hellfire for eternity. This is when the person professes Islam, but in his heart, he completely disbelieves. In his heart, he completely disbelieves. Okay? Now you might think, why would a person do that? We'll come to learn, inshallah. The other type of uh, nifaq is niqad, uh, nifaq amali. Nifaq amali. Nifaq of the actions. This is where essentially, where the person is a believer, he believes in his heart, but the actions he does might reflect the opposite of what's in his heart. So he says he believes in Allah. He does righteous, you know, he, he, he sincerely believes in the Akhirah. But he does things which might oppose it. He commits sins, which is a type of nifaq, a type of hypocrisy, which many of us fall into. The Prophet wasallam gave an example of that. He said, Ayatul munafiqi, munafiqi thalathun. The sign of the munafiq is free. There are three signs of the munafiq. إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبْ That when he speaks, he lies. He speaks, he lies. وَإِذَا تُمِنَ خَانَ And when he is entrusted with something, okay, he proves to be treacherous. He completely goes against what he's been entrusted with. وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ and when he promises, he breaks his promise. And another narration, it mentions a fourth uh, quality. إِذَا خَاسَمَ fajr That when he debates and argues, uh, he goes overboard. fajr, And he becomes evil. Now this is a very interesting hadith. 
Very, very interesting hadith. There's a lot we can learn from this hadith. So let's just maybe quickly uh, make a few reflections on this hadith. When he speaks, he lies. Now, how is this a sign of hypocrisy? Because when a person lies, and they intentionally lie, they intentionally lie, they are saying something which they know in their hearts is not true, but they manifest that to be something true. So there's an opposite here. They are saying something which is opposite to what is in their hearts. Hence, is a type of nifaq, a type of hypocrisy. So he's clearly lying, intentionally lying. So this is why we call it, we consider it a type of what nifaq. The second quality is what إِذَا تُمِنَا khana That when he is entrusted with something, he betrays that trust. So for example, a person gives something to you to look after, as an example, an amana. And they say, please, will you look after this while I'm away, for example? And you say, yes, I will look after it. No problem. What do you do? You take that amana with the intention to abuse that amana, to abuse it. So there's a type of treachery and a type of mistrust there. So again, you can see the opposite there. وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ And when he makes a promise, he breaks that promise. Meaning, at the time of making that promise, he intends not to fulfill that promise. So you say to a person, I promise to you I will come to visit you on such and such a day. And in your heart, at that moment in time, you say, I'm not going to visit him. In ifaq, hypocrisy. Because you're manifesting something which is completely not in the heart. Okay, what about this though? What if you make a promise, and at the time of the promise, you sincerely intended to fulfill that promise? So you say, for example, I promise to you I'll come and meet you on Saturday. You make that promise sincerely. Friday night comes, and then you realize, oh, you know, I, I was meant to go somewhere else. Or, for example, you become very tired. And he become lazy and he said, you know what, I can't make it, unfortunately. He's broken his promise. Okay? Is this haram? Is this nifaq? The answer is no. It's clearly not nifaq because at the time of the promise, he didn't actually what, uh, intend to break that promise. So there was no contradiction between the outward state and the inward state. Okay, is he in sin though for breaking that promise? According to majority of the scholars, he is not actually in sin. Even if he had a, a lame reason to break that promise. Rather we say it is highly recommended for him to, uh, to, make that, to fulfill that promise. Some scholars said when it comes to financial maybe commitments and promises, uh, there are some further discussion there and difference amongst the uh, scholars. According to the other riwayah, the Prophet mentioned a fourth quality of nifaq, which is what? إِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرْ That when he خَاصَمَ uh, فَجَرْ That when he debates and argues فَجَرْ He becomes evil. Now what has that got to do with uh, nifaq? What is the point of arguing and debating? It is to what? Manifest the truth. The manifest, to manifest the truth and to make the truth the, uh, the upper set. To have the upper hand essentially. But what tends to happen in many cases is in debates and arguments, people's egos get involved. People's egos get involved. And so as a result, it's no longer about uh, manifesting the truth. Rather, it becomes about what? Winning the argument, even if you know you are holding the wrong view. Okay? Even though you know, for example, you might be corrected, and you realize you're in the wrong, but what do you still do? You still go on with your previous argument. And as a result, instead of trying to manifest the truth, you're manifesting falsehood, and you're manifesting falsehood through your attitude and behavior as well. So you begin to swear, you begin to use foul language, for example, or you might become abusive violently or verbally, what have you. That defeats the purpose. Because what, what did we say the, pur the purpose of debating was about or arguing was about? To manifest the truth. But how is showing foul language and foul behavior, what's that got to do with the truth? It's the opposite. So it's contrary to what should be in your heart and hence it's a type of nifaq. So this is nifaq amali. Okay, nifaq amali or 
nifaq of the actions. And this is a type of nifaq that a lot of the companions used to fear. This is a type of nifaq that a lot of the companions used to fear. And this is a type of nifaq we all fear for ourselves. But the companions also sometimes used to be fearful of the nifaq i'tiqadi. Nifaq of belief as well, subhanallah. As we said, the example of who? Umar ibn Khattab. Which shows you subhanallah and you might think, no, how can that be? I can't imagine that. Let us come to the end of the discussion of these ayat and you will see how the companions were able to feel like that. The key word as we will see, وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ Okay, just remember that phrase, وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ They cannot perceive it and then it will become clear why the companions were able to feel like that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ Ah, before we move on, uh, uh, this nifaq, it took place, as we know, in the Madani period. In the Mecki period, where the Muslims were a minority, there was no real reason for there to be nifaq. Okay, there was no real reason to be nifaq. In fact, the opposite of nifaq, okay, if there was a reason to be anything, it would be the opposite of nifaq. What's the opposite of nifaq? Where you proclaim kufr, or you have iman in your heart. That's the opposite. Nifaq is when you have disbelief in your heart and you pro- proclaim Islam. In Mecca, that's what the people were doing the opposite. They were too scared to show their Islam. Okay, so they pronounced kufr where they had iman in their hearts. Why? Because they were scared of their life and their property. And that was allowed. You know, if people were being coerced into committing kufr, that was allowed. To say it I verbally as long as they had belief in their iman, uh, belief in their hearts. Okay. Whereas when the Muslims migrated to Medina, when the Muslims migrated to Medina, now the Muslims were in the majority. They had no reason to hide their iman. In fact, it was the asal was to manifest. The basic premise was to manifest your iman. There's no fear. Okay? So what happened? The Jews remained as Jews. No problem. There were people around the, the Aus and the Khazraj tribes that even remained upon their kufr from Ahl Kitab. There was no nifaq. And then what happened after the Battle of Badr? When the kuffar in Medina saw the strength of the Muslims, they became afraid. And they thought if they could strike such a severe, severe blow to the mushrikeen, Imagine what they can potentially do to us. Not only that, if they are that strong, if they are that strong, you know, militarily, and they have that strength and courage, and they defeated the Quraysh like that in that battle, they have the potential to form a formidable army, and a formidable army means formidable war booty. Okay? And so why not join them in that? So we can see that the primary reasons for nifaq were two. Fear and love of dunya. Fear for what? Fear for their own lives and for their own status in society. But also love of dunya. Love of dunya. Now, looking at our situation as Muslims in here in the West... No one, there's, there's no reason to be a munafiq from the perspective of fear. There's no fear. I mean, it's, in fact, it's the opposite. If there's anything, it will be the other way around. Meaning we would maybe profess our disbelief and hide our iman due to the Islamophobia and what have you, if anything. Okay? Although we haven't reached that level yet. Okay, we can still profess our Islam quite openly and that's no problem. Alhamdulillah. The real issue though is the issue of fear. And there are people maybe within our community who would openly profess Islam but in their hearts they disbelieve. And you might think, why not just leave the faith altogether? Because what happens when a person just leaves the faith altogether? They become ostracized within their communities. They become ostracized within their communities. And also if people have an agenda to try and rewrite the Islamic narrative within this country and try and maybe change and reform uh, traditional orthodox normative Islam 
then it makes sense to remain within the boundaries of Islam or openly profess your Islam. So as I said, if you were to leave openly, what would happen? No one would listen. You would become ostracized. Or this is a person who is just you know, an apostate uh, and they therefore will have no uh, real weight in terms of their words, will have no real weight within the Muslim community. <laughs> but if you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you say, I'm a Muslim. But then you say, look, this is what needs to change about Islam. Okay, people actually might even listen to you. So there is a reason to fear nifaq in this day and age as well. From that perspective. And as Rasulullah said, Inna akhwafa ma akhafu ala ummati kulla munafiqin alim al lisan. The thing I fear uh, most for my ummah is every munafiq who is eloquent in his speech. And that's what we find today. Zanadiqa, or people who essentially uh, might be, you know, hold the banner of Islam, but in reality are trying to destroy it from within. So that's the danger there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ From amongst mankind. And what is profound about the choice of word here, from amongst mankind, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ Now, nas, if you just look at it linguistically, where it originates from. Some scholars have the view that uh, nas, is, is, is derived from the word nos, nos, nasa yanusu, which means taharruk, which means movement. Taharruk and movement. And it's interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes the munafiqeen in other places in the Quran, how does he describe them? Mudabdabin. Mudabdabin means what? They're swaying, they're moving. La ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula. They're not towards them, nor, to the, nor are they towards them, meaning they are not inclined towards the believers, nor are they completely inclined towards the disbelievers. They're mudabdabin. They're sort of swaying, moving in between. So Allah says when describing the, the munafiqeen here, homin and nas, he uses the word nas, which, as we know, means people from amongst mankind, but he has that connotation of movement, nos. And that's according to one interpretation of the scholars. Other scholars, they said uh, nas, um, it originates from the word uns. Uns. And uns means when a person finds that sort of serenity and comfort being in the company of someone else. So you have someone who is your anis, someone who is close to you, and you can sort of confide in them and find, you know, uh, serenity and sympathy and what have you in their, in their presence. And that's the nature of man. They said insan, man was called that because... Man by nature, by his taba, by his nature, he is a person of uns, a person who is sociable, needs to interact with other people. Um, others said that, uh, and this is an opinion that many scholars actually rejected, but uh, insan, or the word nas, is related to the word nisyan, forgetfulness. And there's an athar of Ibn Abbas to that effect. Many scholars said linguistically uh, it doesn't make a real sense. But man was called that because he, he forgets a lot. Man forgets a lot. Uh, whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forget. So anyhow, that's just from the linguistic perspective of what Nas means. So, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ They say that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last day. وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ But they are not believers. Now, what is interesting to note here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ There are two interesting points about this. Firstly, Allah says, they are not mu'mineen, but He didn't say they are not muslimin. He didn't say they are not muslimin, but He said, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Now there's a reason behind that, because there is a difference between Islam and Iman. There's a difference between Islam and Iman. What's the difference between the two? When both phrases are mentioned together in the same sentence or in the same discussion, Islam has a, a more of a specific meaning than its general understanding. Like if I was to ask you now, what is Islam about? You say Islam is the five pillars, it's to believe in Allah on the last day. Yeah. So you're including aspects of inward faith. But if I said, okay, what's the difference between Islam and Iman? Then there you give Islam a more specific meaning. Islam, in that sense, means what? Outward submission. Like when the Prophet ﷺ came to Jibril, sorry, when Jibril came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, what, what's Islam? 
What is Islam? And he replied by saying, Islam is that you bear witness that La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, establish the prayer, give zakat, do hajj, fast, etc. These are all outward matters. But when it came to describing Iman, he described what? The inward aspects. That's because they were mentioned in that one gathering. But if I was just to speak about Islam generally, that would include what? Aspects of Iman, isn't it? That's why the scholars have a phrase, إِذَا اجْتَمَعَ اِفْتَرَقَ وَإِذَا اِفْتَرَقَ اِجْتَمَعَ Meaning, when both phrases are mentioned in the same sentence, اِفْتَرَقَ They have different meanings. وَإِذَا اِفْتَرَقَ اِجْتَمَعَ But if they are mentioned separately on their, on, on their, on their, on its own occasion, then they essentially are synonymous terms. So for example, if someone asked you, what is Islam? How would you describe it? Would you just describe it with the five pillars of Iman, Islam? Would you also include aspects of faith? Would you include aspects of faith? Yes, you would include aspects of faith. Okay? Likewise, when someone asks you, what is Iman? You say, Iman is to believe in the heart, to profess on the tongue, and to what? Act upon that. Actions. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And they are not truly believers. But are they Muslimin? Are hypocrites Muslimin? What do you think? From one perspective, yes. Because what does Muslim mean? What does Muslim mean? To submit outwardly. And do the Munafiqin uh, outwardly submit to Islam? Yes. They pray, they fast, they give zakat. You see them in the masajid. Okay, you see them in the masajid. Okay, but the, the, the specific word that was chosen, Mu'minin, is to reflect that they had no faith, inward faith in their heart, but outwardly they might have professed Islam. So Allah says, وَمِنَا And the second important point that we can learn from this ayah is, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَا يَقُولُ آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ We have believed in Allah on the last day. Is that a verb or a noun? آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ Verb or a noun? Verb. وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ مُؤْمِنِينَ Is a verb or a noun? Noun. Okay, now the difference between, the, there's a difference. So Allah didn't say, وَلَا you know, وَلَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا And they didn't really believe. He didn't use the verb. He used the word, he used a noun. Now there's a difference between using a verb and a noun. Because using verbs restricts the usage in terms of time. So they say, we, we have believed. So in the past tense. But nouns, on the other hand, are not restricted to time. They are timeless. So when Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ that Meaning, they, they are not believers. That means, they never were believers in the past, they are not believers now, and they never will be believers. That's what nifaq it does to you. Once it settles in the heart, it grows and grows and grows until your heart is sealed. فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا As Allah says, and you, you know, Allah will increase them in marad, in sickness. Now, an important lesson that we learn from this, a lesson of aqidah that we learn from this, is that pronouncing your faith upon your tongue is not enough to enter into the fold of Islam. Okay, it's not, it's not enough to enter into the fold of Islam. And just to profess your faith and say, look, I'm a believer, and you feel safe just by that, it's not enough, brothers and sisters. It must penetrate the heart, and you must act upon that. Too many people are content by the fact that they say, I am a Muslim. And they think they are saved by that. No, look what Allah says. How many people are there? They say, آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ They are not believers. They say it with their tongues, but they do not really believe in their hearts. So we learn from this that in order for your iman to be accepted, in order for your faith to be accepted, you must have true faith in the heart. You must believe in it with certainty. Okay. So, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ A number of mufassirin uh, had an, uh, brought up a number of issues um, at this point when they were speaking about the hypocrites, the munafiqin, those who openly profess their faith, yet they didn't have it in their hearts. Why did the Prophet wasallam let them be? Why didn't he openly challenge them? Why didn't he even execute them? Why didn't he? Because now hypocrites... 
essentially in this modern day context hypocrites are renegades people who have infiltrated the system and essentially they are committing treason okay because faith for is for muslims is like their national identity the way the british for example view their national identity and the way they respect it okay and they you know re- refer to it and revere it that's how muslims are with regards to their faith so for example you know in in britain they say we do not tolerate what anti british values isn't it okay so there's no tolerance when it comes to that okay they expect muslims to be loyal to the british way of life they won't say that about religion because for them religion has been reduced to the status of what a mere culture culture and tradition okay but for us the way they view their british way of life is the way we view our religion okay and so subhanallah imagine someone tried to infiltrate the british you know system and try to commit treason what would happen that they'll be outcasted isn't it thrown into prison and what have you so munafiq is like that and he should be treated in that way but in islam subhanallah we, we are told to let them be we are told to let them be when well, what is the reason behind this there are a number of uh, uh, reasons some of the fuqaha they mentioned but we mentioned the most uh, maybe uh, the uh, common opinion which is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam left them for maslaha he left them for benefit and what is that benefit uh تألف القلوب so that the hearts of the munafiqin maybe they would eventually come back to islam and also for another important reason that people would not say that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam kills his own people kills his own people the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said اخاف ان يتحدث الناس ان محمدا يقتل اصحابه i fear that people will say about muhammad that he kills his companions what does this mean this is very 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 relevant to our situation here today brothers and sisters what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is essentially saying here is that he is cognizant and he is aware and conscious about the image that he has outside of his own community He doesn't want the prophet sallallahu he doesn't want Islam and himself to gain and develop a bad name. Look Muhammad he kills his own people. What would what would people say? What would people say outside? They think look at these people, barbaric people. They kill their own people. Do you think they'll want to enter into Islam? No way. Now people might say well as Muslims we shouldn't care what other people think. We should do as you know we are told to do. Yeah. So this we say no. we have to be aware and we have to be careful to maintain a sound image of ourselves on condition that we do not want compromise on our faith we shouldn't seek to appease if it means compromising on our faith but if it means maintaining a good image without compromising our faith by all, you know by all means we should do that we should do that okay and so uh, this is very very important And likewise if people commit wrong within our community we should be clear and say you know this is wrong when khalid ibn walid he he wrongly killed some people the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ana bari mimma fa'ala khalid that i am free from what khalid did when the muslims they killed the Mus- uh, when they killed the, uh, and, and attacked that caravan uh, prior to uhud The prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about this incident wa yasaluna kan shahr al haram qital fi they ask you about fighting in the sacred month qul qital fi hi kabir say fighting in the sac- in the sacred month it's a major matter meaning it's wrong and Allah is teaching us that when muslims amongst our community commit wrong we should admit to it we should admit to it but not at the same time go as far as to fall in line with the narrative of the uh, those who are attacking islam And so many times I've heard for exa- just an example the the reporter that was killed um uh, last week or the or the week before I saw some Muslims commentating on this and they said you know why should we condemn it why should we condemn it 
you know, they're doing so much wrong to us uh, as Muslims, why should we condemn it? It's true, what they're doing, they're, they're committing many wrongs. But does that mean we don't condemn wrong when we see it? No, we should condemn it. Maybe not make it the be-all and the end-all in terms of our, make that our da'wah now, just to condemn whenever we see a Muslim do something wrong. We just condemn them. And that's it. We just look for the mistakes of the Muslims. No. Be balanced in your approach. If, if they do something wrong, be fair to admit it. Otherwise, if, if the non-Muslim community see us that we don't condemn wrong, when we ourselves commit wrong, then again, they're just going to see us just like you know, the, those people that committed that, that act. Okay? So we learn a lot from the Prophet ﷺ in the way he dealt with the wanafiqeen, in the way he dealt with the hypocrites. Um, now, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another important lesson we learn here, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now begun by speaking about the munafiqeen and He is speaking about them in detail indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us the ways to avoid nifaq and to avoid the harms of its people. He's teaching us how to avoid nifaq and teaching us how to avoid the harms of the people. So He's going to teach us characteristics of the hypocrites. So therefore, Muslims, we should be consciously aware of what hypocrisy is and what are the traits of hypocrisy so that we can warn ourselves and others about it. Now, this doesn't mean we delve into uh, labeling people munafiqeen. Okay? You know, the purpose of this is to be aware of the, 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 the attitude and the traits of nifaq. Not necessarily naming a person a munafiq. And this is one of the problems of, of shabab, of youth. Okay, when they delve into the issues of naming people, of takfir, of tafsiq, of naming people kuffar, you know, they think that's the purpose, that's the, that's the idea behind it. Just to label them and give them a title. That's not the point. The point is not just to label them as a kafir, it's to be aware of their situation, and if they have fallen into error, that we correct them. Okay? If, they've, if they've done wrong, it's like, for example, the issue of the Muslim rulers today. Everyone talks about the Muslim, are the Muslim rulers kuffar or not? Why be bothered about that? Do we all agree that they are not ruling by the law of Allah? We all agreed by that. That's it. Khalas. Khalas. That's all we need to know. Therefore, we should work, work for reform and change. Why do you insist? Why do people insist we have to make takfir? Why do people insist? Uh... The other day, I think I mentioned this, uh, maybe, there was an incident where uh, I was giving a lecture once and uh, a sister, she asked a question, a very sort of innocent sister, she asked a question and she said, um, uh, you can tell she didn't have much knowledge and she said, you know, in, in, it would sound quite bad, but she said, you know, why is Allah uh, so selfish that he only wants to be worshipped? Okay, which is a very you know, dangerous statement. So I spent a lot of time explaining to her, you know, why, why that's not the case. Allah is not selfish. So a brother, he writes a long letter after the, the, the lesson. And uh, he said, she committed an act of kufr. Okay, why didn't you basically, you know, make that clear that she committed kufr? So I, yeah, and yeah, I read it and I thought, look, the, the idea is not to label, but it's to, to guide. Imagine I said, yeah, sister, yeah, ukhti. Say your shahada again, you're a kafirah. <laughs> okay, you know, you should probably have thought, you know, who is this takfiri? <laughs> okay. Ajib, subhanAllah, this brother, I actually met him a few weeks ago. He came up to me and, um, you know, he said, uh, you know, what do you say about a sister who said X, Y, Z? I said, oh, subhanAllah, you're the brother that wrote that letter. And he said, yes, it's me. And I said, uh, I said, yeah, what do you want me to do? What do you want me, honestly, what do you want me to do with this sister? Do you want me to make it clear that she's a kafirah? Is that what you want me to do? Is that what you want for her? Or do you want her to be saved? And isn't that what I did? I tried to explain to her how to have that attitude is wrong and that you need to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not selfish. Subhanallah. Okay, and that's how I, I feel, unfortunately, <laughs> For many of us in the community, it's, it's become like that. You know, we, we want to quickly put on, you know, attach the labels to people and forget about the haqaiq, the reality of the people behind the labels. Okay, that was 
more important. Anyway, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then uh, continues in, in, uh, in verse 9 now. So in verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established that there are some of these munafiqeen. They say they believe in Allah on the last day, but they are not truly believers. Allah describes them now in verse 9 further. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ That they seek to يُخَادِعُونَ They seek to deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who believe. But they do not deceive except themselves. But they realize it not. They realize it not. Or they do not realize it. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begun to describe now the munafiqin. So this is their first characteristic. That they try to deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how do they try and um, deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because they are openly manifesting their faith, but they're hiding it within their hearts. This is clear. And they think that by them doing that, they can actually hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even speaks about munafiqeen in other ayat in the Qur'an, how on the Day of Judgment they'll be following the believers in the Akhirah, who are going to paradise. And they think they've actually fooled Allah. But then Allah says, فَضُرِبَ That a, a, a barrier will be placed between them. And they will say, you know, wait for us. أُنظُرُونَ نَقْتَبِسْ مِن نُورِكُمْ And they wait for us, let us take from your light. But that barrier will be placed between them. That will protect them, that will separate them from the believers. So they actually, they are that deluded to think that they are actually safe. Subhanallah. So that means, brothers and sisters, that there are munafiqeen who they know they have some sort of nifaq, but they think it's okay. They think it's okay. They think they will be all right at the end of the day. Which shows you how deluded they are. Which shows you how deluded they are. Because Allah says, وَمَا They cannot feel it. They do not realize it. They cannot perceive it. So, uh, now, um, now, yukhadi'oon Allah. Now, listen very carefully. Yukhadi'oon Allah. Now, yukhadi'oon is taken from the verb khada'a yukhadi'u. Okay? Kha, alif, dal, ayn. Khada'a yukhadi'u. Which is a, a, a different form to the basic form of deceiving, which is what? Khada'a yukhadi'u. Khada'a yukhadi'u. And that basic form of the verb is mentioned at the end of the ayah. وَمَا what وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ And they do not deceive except themselves. So there's a mention, يُخَادِعُونَ and then يَخْدَعُونَ Both forms of the verb have been mentioned. Now, actually, in other qiraat, uh, there are some different ways you can recite it. So يُخَادِعُونَ is mentioned in both, uh, in both places in the ayah according to other qiraat. Okay, but in this qiraat of Hafsan Asim, يُخَادِعُونَ is mentioned for the first deceiving. And يَخْدَعُونَ is mentioned for the second deceiving. Now what's the difference? Any verb that follows a pattern of فَاعَلَ where you add an extra alif at the beginning of the verb. So this is in this case خَادَعَ or rather than خَدَعَ conveys a meaning of what we say اشتراك where there are two or more people uh, doing the act at the same time. So for example جَاهَدَ uh, جَاهَدَ means what? Striving against someone else. So when you're striving against someone else, someone is striving against you as well. Hence jihad is a, you can't do jihad by yourself. Okay, it has to be against someone else, isn't it? I mean, there's jihad on nafs, but you're doing jihad against your own nafs because your nafs is fighting you back. Okay, but in, in, the, in, the, in the military time, you know, jihad means fighting against a, another person. Uh, so, Allah. So they are trying to deceive Allah. Now this is mentioned, therefore someone is deceiving them. Who's deceiving them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does that mean? How is this the case? Imam al-Shawkani explains this. He says, لَمَّا أَجْرَى عَلَيْهِمْ أَحْكَامَ الْإِسْلَامِ مَا أَنَّهُمْ لَيْسُ مِنْهُ فِي شَيْءٍ فَكَأَنَّهُ خَادَعَهُمْ بِذَلِكُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He applied the laws of Muslims to them. Because we said, how did the Prophet ﷺ treat the munafiqun? He treated them as believers. He gave them salam, etc. He ate from their meat, etc. And he, he treated them as believers. They are treated as believers in this world of life. So Allah applied the laws of Islam to them. So they therefore fought by that 
that they are safe. But no, they are not safe. So they're trying to deceive Allah by their ignorance, but what? Allah is actually tricking them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tricking them. And that's not in a deceptive way, but because of them trying to deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is applying the same back uh, to them. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So they also try to, they, they also try to deceive the, um, the believers uh, as well. In the same way. وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ And then this is the key word here. وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they cannot feel it. They do not perceive it. Now this word here, to feel, شعور. Now شعور, what is شعور? العلم بالأشياء الخفية. It means to have knowledge of the finer affairs in life. It means to have knowledge of the finer affairs in life. This is why a شاعر, does you know you know who a شاعر is? What is a شاعر? A poet. And as you know, poets they're very good with what emotions and feelings. They know how to express themselves very well, because poets generally are in touch with their in an in inward state. They are in touch with their emotions. They're in touch with their emotions. Uh, likewise, uh, sha'ar. Sha'ar is a word as well, which is similar to this. Sha'ar. What is sha'ar? Does anyone know what sha'ar is? Hair. Because your hair is very thin and fine, isn't it? Okay? It's thin and fine. So your strands of hair are very thin and fine. So shu'ur means to be aware of the fine affairs. Wa ma yashu'urun. Okay, and that's why there's a phrase in Arabic, Ya layta shi'ri. Ya layta shi'ri. Which means like, if only, if only I had finer knowledge of that matter. It's to lament the fact that you don't have that fine knowledge. Ya layta shi'ri. Now, um, this is profound. Really, really, this is, we can speak a whole lesson about this particular word. وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ They do not feel it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, they're trying to deceive Allah. Now you might think, who will be foolish enough to try and deceive Allah? But the reality is that they tried it. Not because simply out of stupidity, because they couldn't even perceive it. They were doing it and they didn't even realize that they were trying to trick Allah. Meaning, if you basically went up to them and say to them, are you trying to fool Allah? They would probably say, no. Why would we try and fool Allah? Who would do such a thing? Who would do such a thing? Meaning they were st- so stooped into nifaq, into hypocrisy, their hearts were so hardened, they didn't even realize that they were trying to fool Allah. Now what is scary about this, brothers and sisters, is that if you cannot connect to your inward state, if you lack Shu'ur, if you lack feelings of your own state, you can easily fall into what? Nifaq. Subhanallah. Allah says, don't be like those who, uh, who forgot Allah. And so as a result, Allah made them forget their own selves. You might think, how can I forget my own self? I know my name, my age, my date of birth. No. You do not know your true inward state. And that's why you find in Islam, uh, before we go on, Imam Shawkani he explains this, why they were in such a state. It is due to their persistent ghafla, due to their persistent heedlessness, that it is as if he's a person who has no senses. He cannot feel, he cannot touch, he cannot see. Now in Islam, this is why we say, in Islam, in our religion, to focus on refining your feelings, it is so important. Knowing what you feel, knowing what others feel, is one of the key aspects of our religion. Masha'ir lil akhirin, Being empathetic and understanding the feelings of other people. If you look, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba and the righteous people, they were very aware of their inward state. Such that they couldn't detect a change of intention. Sufyan al what did he say about his intention? مَا عَلَجْتُ 
شيئا أشد علي من نيتي. I've never dealt with anything more difficult in my life than my intention. It constantly changes. I mean, they could detect just as that one instant that something would happen. Something wrong is happening in their nafs. Sufyan Afari once was giving a lecture and he felt as though due to the re- reaction from the crowd that pride entered his heart. Okay, maybe he saw the reaction, someone was amazed at what he was saying. So what did he do? He got so worried and, af- and afraid, he ran out of the room. He ran out of the room. He ran out of the room, subhanAllah. Now, we can see the Prophet ﷺ was like this with other people. He was always concerned about how other people feel. He was that empathetic. When he saw, even with children, he was empathetic with children. He was concerned about the feelings of other children. Once he saw a young boy playing with a bird. Yeah, uh, he was playing with a bird, and the next day he saw him without the bird, and, the, and uh, without the bird, and the boy was sad. And uh, and so he said to the boy, "Yeah, Abu Umair, ma fa'al al-nughayr." He said in a really loving way, "Oh, Abu Umair, what happened to the nughayr? What happened to the small bird?" I mean, he was empathetic. He wanted. He was in touch with the feelings of with other people, with, with children. He was in touch with feelings of his wives. When Aisha radiallahu anha, when he took the glass from her, what did he do? He moved the cup such that his lips would be placed on the place where, uh, where Aisha placed her lips. Anha. Why? Because he wanted to be aware of her feelings. Okay? He was like this with his companions. When, when people would come and visit him, they would stay for a very, very long time. Such that it would begin to, you know, upset the Prophet ﷺ. But he was so concerned not to upset the other companions. What happened as a result? Allah had to reveal an ayah to make it clear to the believers, don't harm the Prophet ﷺ in his home. And in the Prophet ﷺ finding that difficult to say to someone, basically, you've stayed long enough. Okay? And in the Prophet ﷺ couldn't do it. He didn't want to upset the feelings of other Muslims. That's how we should be as believers. We should be that empathetic. We should be so in tune with our own feelings with the feelings of other people. That is what makes a person's akhlaq stand out above everyone else's. If you lack this empathy, if you lack that empathy, your akhlaq with Allah goes down the drain. Okay? You become heedless of your own state. You become heedless of your own state. And as a result, you can easily fall into nifaq. And you become heedless of the people around you. So you become harmful to them. You become abusive to them. Okay? And you create more facade than you do Good. Um, we really need to end there. Um, but just on a final point, okay? Just on a final point, very quickly, inshallah, one important thing that we learn from this ayah the importance of humility. The importance of humility. Why? Because Allah is saying, These people are trying to deceive Allah, wa ma they do not feel it. Therefore, we can be in wrong. We could be doing wrong things. We could be holding wrong beliefs. Not about Islam, but maybe about the finer things about in our religion. But we do not feel it that we are in the wrong. We don't, might not realize it. So we should always employ humility in the stances that we take in life, in our behavior with other people, because we might not be able to feel it. SubhanAllah. If munafiqeen can't feel their nifaq, which is so deep and ingrained, then it's very easy for us to maybe not feel our smaller errors. On that point uh, we will conclude for today inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.